Lola, click on your name and sometimes it might say start video. Yeah, I've done all that. <laughs> I turned my light on. <laughs> That's what I did. <laughs> like a Martian. Man. Hey, Maureen. Hey, Martha. All right, we're going live on Facebook. All right, and we're going to get started. So again, I want to welcome everyone to this virtual event for building your literary community. This is our third and final event in May for this month. Um, we're celebrating our Made in Michigan Writers series. So we've been doing these events virtually. And um, we've been so happy with the turnout and I want to thank anyone who participated in the previous two events. So one was um, about writing thematic poetry and another one was about a nonfiction event about writing through grief and both of those are on our Facebook page if you didn't catch them I would really encourage you go um, go and watch them on the Wayne State Press Facebook page because they're really fantastic discussions um, this event like I said is also being streamed to Facebook live so you can turn your video off if you'd rather not be recorded and please keep your mics muted. Um, we're gonna have only the panelists be unmuted for this event. And you can go ahead and type any questions that you have in the chat window. Um, I'll be monitoring those and passing along to Desiree who will be um, leaving some time at the end for questions for our panelists. Um, I'm also gonna be posting some links to the books that are mentioned. And um, I wanted to let everyone know that Wayne State Press has a 40% off sale right now. So you can get all these wonderful books at a really hefty discount and free shipping as well. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our four authors tonight. First, uh, we have Desiree Cooper, who will be moderating tonight's discussion. Desiree is a 2015 Kresge Artist Fellow and Pulitzer Prize nominated journalist. She became a Made in Michigan author in 2016 with her award-winning debut collection of flash fiction, Know the Mother which is now in its third printing. Uh, her flash fiction has appeared in The Best Small Fictions 2018, for 21st Century Fiction, and Electric Literature. And her essay, We Have Lost Too Many Wigs, was listed as a notable essay in The Best American Essays 2019. Her short film, The Choice, has won several awards, including a 2019 Outstanding Achievement Award from the Berlin Flash Film Festival. Next, we have Kelly Forden, who is a two-time Made in Michigan Writer Series author, with her newest short story collection being I Have the Answer that was just published last month. Her other series contribution is the award-winning collection Garden for the Blind. She is also the author of a poetry chapbook, The Witness, which won an Eric Hoffer Award, and a poetry collection, Goodbye Toothless House. Sorry, I'm still having to click to let people in back and forth. So. Uh, Laura Thomas uh, is the author of the short story collection States of Motion and her short fiction and essays have appeared in a number of journals and anthologies including the Simran Review, Nimrod International Journal, Epiphany, and Witness. She received her MFA in fiction writing from Warren Wilson College and she currently heads the undergraduate creative writing program at U of M's residential college where she teaches fiction and creative nonfiction. Last but definitely not least, we have Lolita Hernandez. She's with us. Her video is not currently working, but she is here and she can hear, hear everyone else. We can hear her. She's the author of two collections of short stories. Her Made in Michigan Writer Series book is called Making Callaloo in Detroit, and it was named a 2015 Michigan Notable Book. She also wrote Autopsy of an Engine and Other Stories from the Cadillac Plant, which won the Penn Beyond Margins Award. Her short fiction and poetry have been published in a wide variety of literary venues. She is also the 2012, a 2012 Kresge Fellow. After over 33 years as a UAW member at General Motors and 12 on the faculty of the University of Michigan Creative Writing Department, she recently retired to Las Vegas from her native Detroit, Michigan. And with that, I will hand it over to Desiree, who's going to moderate tonight. Thanks so much, Jamie and Wayne State University Press. I have my Wayne State mug right here. I'm so proud to be um, 
a member of the Made in Michigan Writers Series, along with these other amazing writers. Um, please pay some attention to where you can get these books um, from these authors. They are, are stellar works and they show the breadth of the kind of writing that comes out of Michigan and that's supported by the press. And it's on sale, so such a deal. You guys have got to make sure you get them. Special condolences and congratulations to Kelly, who had a launch in the middle of these difficult times. And Lolita has joined us visually. Yay! I'm Yay. here! Hi! I'm here. Hi. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm down. I'm down. <laughs> Resistance is everything. Um, so Kelly, uh, I was talking about Kelly's book, Collection of Short Stories. Uh, it must be so hard to, to come out at a time like this. And the fact that all of you guys are here, here to hear her voice and here to kind of support her in the second month of her, um, of the launch of her book. So check it out. Check them all out. Okay. So um, what we wanted to do is hop right into the topic of the, of the day, and that is building a community around your writing. When we all know how lonely and isolating writing is, and we really want that so that our brains have space to expand, and yet sometimes we feel like we're going into a black hole, we're stuck, um, we've lost connection with real life out there and uh, with a community. And as I found out, if you don't know other writers, it's really hard to get your book going. I mean, you just have got to network and know people. And so that's what we're talking about today. Um, I've asked everyone or everyone wanted to make sure that you heard their voices. So they're going to read a little passage from their work just so you get a flavor for their writing. Um, and But this passage is going to be related to some kind of way that the writing community helped this work evolve or launch. So we're going to start with Kelly. Okay. Jump in, Hi, Kelly. everyone. <laughs> okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Yeah. Thank you so much to Wayne State for doing this. I'm going to read um, a little short snippet of one of the stories in my collection called Why Did I Ever Think This Was a Good Idea? And I'm reading it because Des and I were in a writer's group, and this was um, roughly the stage of life I was at um, is described in this story. So I'll, I'll read it to you. Um, so this is a story about a middle-aged woman named Bridget Flanagan who has three children, and the last one, William, is about to leave home in six days. Um, he saved up all his lawn money because he wants to travel, and they've had a very difficult relationship um, for the past couple of years, pretty typical teenage relationship, and that's pretty much all you need to know. Down in the kitchen, William said, can you believe I leave in six days? Nope, Bridget said, aghast at the mountain of dirty dishes in the sink. Where had they all come from? You know, I was thinking, I was going through my stuff. Do you think we could go shopping one of these days? When he put her, his hand on her shoulder, Bridget tried not to flinch. So just a minute ago, I was so stupid and now you wanna go shopping, she said. I know, mom, I feel terrible about that. I don't know why I said it, you're the best. He removed his hand and went over to the cupboard to extract yet another bowl. Bridget opened another cupboard and noticed he had used every last cup. I mean, what is this mess? When I went to bed last night, the kitchen was clean. Some of the guys came over to watch a movie, he said. Sorry about that. I'll take care of it after I do my lawns. When will that be exactly, Bridget said. I'll be back around 11. Anyway, I really need some new shoes. It would be fun to go shopping later today. We could go out to the mall and then we could stop into Jeepers. Bridget raised her eyebrows. For years, William had been obsessed with Jeepers, the indoor amusement park, the mall. Bridget would take him along with a friend at least once a month. How she had hated Jeepers, the loud whiz banging of the machines, the incessant chiming and bells that signaled success at the pinball machine, the inevitable shrieking when someone dropped their popcorn or their candy, or when the small roller coaster provoked nausea. I'm skipping some. At Jeepers later that afternoon, Bridget asked the attendant at the front door if they could just walk through once for old time's sake. Immediately, the noise hit her like a slap. The zooming, screaming kids, the slushy machine whirring. She wanted to stick her fingers in her ears and scream. She and William walked over to the miniature roller coaster. One boy, around four or five, was riding in a car, looping around and around. He rode with his arms in the air, and every time he passed his harried-looking mother, he yelled, whoa! whoa look at you she called then when he was out of sight she glanced down at her phone for a second but a second was all she got because around he came again 
whoa, they both called out to each other. William looked over at Bridget and they both laughed. This roller coaster used to seem enormous, he said. The pint-sized car came to a halt and the little kid jumped off. William looked like a giant standing next to him. You never stopped screaming, Bridget said. You screamed from the moment they put you on until I pulled you off. In fear, Bridget shook her head. All of these kids would be crying and having meltdowns on the little tilt-a-whirl or this little ride here, and you'd be running from one end to the other like, what's next? No fear at all. I wish I felt that way now, William said, looking at the kid and his mother. The kid was trying to convince his mother to stay for one more ride. The mother kept saying it was time to go, but the kid wasn't having it. Something in his tone made Bridget pause. Was he scared now? That thought hadn't occurred to her. Her anger toward him lately had been so all-encompassing. Her energy had been used up just surviving this stage. She hadn't spent any time analyzing what was behind all the nastiness. Wow, wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> sure. Um, Lolita, are, are you feeling settled enough to go next? Oh, I caught her off guard. You have to unmute. <laughs> I muted so that... There you I go. Be making one. Okay, so I'm going to read... Um, just the opening paragraph of a story called uh, Thanks to Abby Wilson from the Autopsy of an Engine book. Sorry, William stayed Press. But um, the reason I wanted to, to do that is because I'm, um, that's my engineering son who's like, straightening me out here. I wanted to do that because I started life um, as a poet and then um, realized I didn't have enough space in poetry to do whatever it is I was trying to do at the time. So I, I, um, I think I was trying to figure out how to write some real grief about the closing of the Cadillac plant. So I, I'm reading this because my first real literary uh, community was the MFA program that I went to in, in Vermont. And um, not that I hadn't had poetry groups that I worked with prior and you know, at that time, poetry was an incredibly hot item in Detroit. But uh, I, I wanted to do fiction, and that, that sort of ended my life with a, the with a literary community for a while. So, thanks to Abby Wilson, everyone had their way of saying goodbye to the motor line. With Abby, it was pound cakes. She baked 25 of them for the final day, almost Everyone followed the job to Livonia, a Detroit suburb, except those close to retirement, those with medical restrictions, and Abby Wilson, who didn't take to change easily. But she brought pound cakes for everyone to eat. Take them home, she said. Take them to the new job in the suburbs. It was what she knew how to do, bake pound cakes. That's what she took out of Hernando, Mississippi. It was what kept her a husband until he died. Oh, it's wonderful. You know, it's interesting. Um, so Kelly, you were talking about a community that sort of thematically matched where you were in life or what you were writing about. And Lolita, you were jumping genres. And so you had to figure out the poetry community was not gonna help you launch your fiction or nonfiction, right? And so you had to kind of get new peeps around you to um, help you cultivate that as a writer. So that's kind of interesting to know when you need a different community than the one you actually have to get your writing to go where it needs to go. Exactly. Um, Laura, how about you? I'm so great. I just want to say thank you to um, Wayne State, to Jamie Jones, to Christina Stonehill, to Emily Novak, to Annie Martin, we're here to talk about literary community, and I can tell you as a made in Michigan author, um, there's no better literary community than the one I have found at Wayne State University Press and all the wonderful authors I've met um, since becoming um, a published author with the press. So really, I'm just, I, I'm full of gratitude for um, the community that Wayne State um, has given us all. Um, so I'm going to read from um, just a couple of paragraphs from a short story called Soul Suspect in my collection, um, States of Motion. And um, I guess I'm, I'm taking a little bit of a different approach in that um, I was inspired to write the story not because of a community I was in, but in, I was thinking of communities in general. 
and how communities change. When I wrote this story, it was the inspiration for this story, actually. And I, was, I wrote it to find out what happens when communities challenge who we think we are. Um, and I think part of our conversation tonight will be about how we um, seek out communities to sometimes push our boundaries as writers, push our comfort levels. Um, and sometimes that can have great results and sometimes we need something a little different and maybe need to pivot. Um, and so uh, the passage I'm reading is fueled by tragedy and I hope that your writing is not tragic as you're seeking out your community. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, so I'm just going to read a couple of paragraphs. Um, the main character, Perry, has been um, used to being thought of in his community as the sole suspect in his, in the disappearance of his daughter and her best friend. And for many years, the community has seen him as a suspect. And then the, bo the bodies of the girls are discovered. They died accidentally. And now his community um, is shifting to seeing him as a grieving father, but having a little bit of difficulty making that shift. And Perry is also finding that he's having difficulty um, coming to terms with the change um, in the community, even though it would be a positive change for him. In many ways, he's become used to the self he was when he was a sole suspect. So here's just a couple of paragraphs. The other family suspicion made sense. Perry understood this. Past a certain age, a man alone is always a sole suspect. His wife had left him without warning, left her daughter behind with Perry, something others felt the mother wouldn't do. Once the other family thought of Perry as their daughter's killer, they'd suspected him of doing away with his wife too. Ellen had in fact moved back in with her parents in upstate New York, a two day drive from their town. He had dropped Elsa in Detroit once so she could take the Amtrak to visit. When Ellen passed away from breast cancer, Perry hadn't run a local obituary, pure spite at the time, his lust to erase her from the town. After he'd grown used to being the suspect in the girl's deaths, it felt natural to become the suspect in his wife's fate. Denise and her family had been relative newcomers before the girls had disappeared. They arrived in town long after Ellen's passing. They wouldn't even know Ellen's friends, the few townies she had kept in touch with before she died. Elsa would have stopped talking about her mother long ago. By the time Perry was a suspect, few, if any, remembered Ellen, except that he'd had a wife who vanished one day. After his arrest, two and two were put together. Even after he was cleared of official suspicion over the girls, the other family looked at him as a man capable of multiple crimes. They avoided him in the farmer Jack Isle, and so did those others whom Perry used to get along with well. They spoke of him. They said unkind things he could easily disprove if he didn't rely so much upon this special regard. Wasn't it better to be thought of as a killer than a man left helpless? Better to be thought of at all, not so lonely that way. Ooh, <laughs> that's really great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so I, you know, just hearing these voices and sort of how communities around you or your thoughts about community pushed and pulled your writing, um, I, I wonder how you all feel about the actual need for a writing community, especially as you have matured as a writer. Like, is this a beginner's thing or is it something that you always need a, a writing community around you? And I'm going to ask the panelists to unmute themselves so you guys can jump in whenever you want. Well, I, Alita, you're unmuted, so. I'm going to jump in, and I, I think you hit the nail on the head with that, Desiree, that um, you, I think your needs change um, over, over a period of time. And I, I've had experience um, with trying to be in both poetry and and you know, mix match kind of writing communities and mm -hmm. at various points in my life. And, I, and it, I'm not sure it sort of worked for me because I am incredibly uh, solitary. I think the, the two that I really work with the most on that is Kelly and, and Laura, as a matter of fact, you know, now that we're talking about it. Back in the day when I first started out with poetry, I was with the Latino Poets Association and there have been odds and ends things, but um, I think, I think um, now, and I realize one of the reasons I read that piece is because community for me hasn't always been literary. Um, now you're, 
you know, your literary community is your editor, <laughs> you know, when you gather some things and then occasional conversations and so on and so forth. And Laura, when I call her hysterically asking for some, some something, and, but um, I, I think my community has always been the factory people, the mm -hmm. people in Detroit, um, the Caribbean people. And that's where I get all my ideas from. And that's who I'm always talking to. One of them's on here, I think, a couple of them, Sue and, mm -hmm. and Mary Kennedy. And, and that, these are the people that um, sort of nurture my soul in a particular kind of way that makes me feel safe to go out and try That is so interesting I say, because yeah. I don't, I, as a writer, I don't often think of the people who take care of my heart and my soul as my writing community. And I do think that um, now the writers that are in my community are, are, uh, you know, they are, they're like me, you know, it's not a hostile community. <laughs> they are friends who support my writing, but I feel like that I have a compartment in my head. That's, and it's so interesting to hear you say that your writing community is a cultural and spiritual community for you. How about for you, Laura? Well, um, when I think about what the question about does a writer need a writing community, you know, to me, it's what, what does the writer want? You know, what does the writer want a, a writing community? What does that community look like? And the fact that that might change, as you pointed out, Des, when you posed the question, it might change over time. Um, I think I've talked with other writers before about the fact that there just is, for us, no one community. Lolita touched on this a little bit. Um, there's the community of folks where you might gather your stories from, and that may not always be from other writers. That might be, as Lolita pointed out, from the factory. It might be from your family. It might be from, you know, whatever cultural or social touchstones are important to you, and that's where you find your stories. And then you might have communities devoted to um, really getting to know other writers, um, uh, other writers' work, getting their critiques, getting that kind of community around you, whether it's hardcore critique um, or maybe a smaller stable of writers, depending on your temperament and personality, who are there to support you, nurture you, even pat you on the back. Maybe what you're, you know, your writing isn't that good, but you need someone to say, yeah, it's okay, keep going, keep going, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and then I just, I think that there are other communities to be found in, in your workplace, especially if it's a writing related um, profession that you're doing. And also, if you're taking the long view professionally, um, and it's usually a very long view, um, mm -hmm. the networking aspect, you know, getting to know folks who might publish you someday, going to conferences, um, signing up for workshops, mm -hmm. um, you know, having a chat with, you know, an editor at a conference. So I don't think there's any one community. And I think what, what writers want at different points in their career based on their temperament and their goals and what they really want as a writer and what they find nurturing is really um, can change. I think it should change. Um, and I think the writer always just has to, you know, kind of check in with themselves about what is um, offering creativity, solace and professional advancement um, and in what order at any particular point in your, in your writing line. I do think you have to be very clear. I like what you said about what do you want out of the community? Um, and that really will point you to what kind of writing community you will build around you. Kelly, how about you? What have you looked for in the community and how have you built them? Well, I think it's changed a lot. I think when I first started out, I wanted the support the most, you know, and I mean, I was new. I didn't really want to be crushed right away. <laughs> and you do need the pat on the back at that point. But then as I've as I've gone on and on and on and I've read more and I realized, you know, I really need some work on some things and I really want someone to tell me what's working and what's not working. So I found myself in communities saying, you know, okay, you know, I'm so psyched that you think that's good, but tell me what's bad. Cause what I really want to know is what's not working, where are you lost? What are you... And so I think that's where Laura and Lolita and I, you know, we were all at that stage where, you know, you just are seasoned enough that you can take it you know, and you're not going to lose your mind. And, and I think I realized like I'm not Leo Tolstoy, you know, or whatever. And, and I don't expect someone to say that. So um, 
when you find friends and you're all at that same level, it's great, mm -hmm. you know, writing friends. Right. I always said for me, I would not have written without a writing group. And for probably 25 years, there was always a writing group around me. Um, two or three other, they were mostly women, even though my last group had a lot of, of men as well. Um, and that was more coincidence. Um, but I always said that you're not gonna, it's like playing tennis against the wall. You know, I mean, you, you gotta have someone that can hit that ball back a little bit. You gotta have someone that's a little better than you because you've gotta hustle to get it, you know, to really catch that volley. And so I know when I started, I was around a lot of writers who said, I'm not gonna show this, like I'm gonna write the whole thing and then I'm gonna wrap it up with a bow and hand it, you know, and let you see it biggest mistake, you know, because things that could have been corrected, you know, right away early on were never corrected. There was no growth throughout the process. And it's because the person was writing under a bushel basket and not really um, learning by the dialogue, by reading other people and by critiquing is a great way to learn um, if you're reading other people's stuff. So uh, really let's just do a fundamental if you guys can maybe each of you name two ways to find the people to be in your community or how did you do that how did you find people well i'm going to tell you i was pretty i pretty well lucked out when i moved to las vegas because um my my daughter and my son-in-law are both um they're both visual artists or involved in the art community and so on and and through them i actually um have met um quite a few people now i have to say because of the exigencies of moving and the stress and all that i, I haven't really been able to hunker down as much as i've wanted to here um in vegas but um you know i've met a, a met a couple of people and I'm, I'm totally incredibly impressed with you know the stories that come out of uh, Vegas, and it's 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 been sort of expansive for me because, you know, now I, you you can get in your own little bubble, especially if you're just in Detroit, knocking around with Detroit people and crazy Caribbean people who are, you know, and, and not realize that there are stories way out here yeah, um, sure. that are happening. And last night I happened to be in one of these. Uh, gallery gallery walks for the MFA program for U University of Nevada Las Vegas and boy it reminded me of how one of my communities in Detroit was the vi were the was the visual artist and how much they influenced me especially mm -hmm. if you're writing fiction and you've got to create worlds that are real and exterior boy there's nothing like a visual artist around Whoa. so you go hunting you're you're the person like if you need a community you go hunting you just look around and see who might be interesting who's inspiring to you who makes you ask questions what about you uh kelly um well i actually submitted some work to university of michigan like when i was like 35 36 and just asked to be in their beginning creative writing class and that was a good way to meet teachers but not necessarily community because everybody else in the class was 20 and I was <laughs> the old lady, you know, they were like, what are you doing here? So, um, but through those teachers, then, you know, then I met the people in our writing group and I have no idea how we all met, but then we would meet in Royal Oak at that coffee shop. And we were just like a random collection of people, but it was so supportive. Uh, I love that group. And then the other place that I, so I wore out my welcome at the University of Michigan. I went to <laughs> five classes. I did too, don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, you've got to enroll here or you, you, know, you can't keep taking the same class over and over with different teachers. So then um, someone suggested writers conferences. And that was a great way, especially if you get a conference, I mean, a uh, scholarship to meet other writers, keep in touch. And then I've traded writing with a lot of those people since then. Mm. So. And a right. lot of people from our writing group does in the one that we were in, so. Mm -hmm. Great, Laura? All right, so I'll give a, a shout out. My most important writing group has uh, come about um, through a connection uh, through my job as a, a instructor of creative writing at the residential college, and that was when Lolita was hired in. And meeting Lolita um, was very important to me. Not only did we just gel right away and felt comfortable sharing work and talking about work and 
talking about everything else um, under the sun besides work, which also meant we were talking about the work without having to talk about the work. And I felt like she really kind of got that, that you don't have to be talking about writing to be talking about writing um, with other writers. And she introduced me to, I believe she introduced me to Kelly and to other writers. And um, that was a very um, important and natural group for me to fall into. And that's been um, endlessly um, supportive. Um, and then I will also mention, there are other things I could mention, but the one that hasn't been mentioned is that I um, was the organizer for a literary festival for three years called Voices of the Middle West. Um, and I met a lot of writers through um, organizing that festival. And that's one thing I can definitely recommend is, um, I think Desiree, you said, you know, if you're the hunter type, you know, go out and find a community that way. Um, what, if you can be an organizer, if that's in your blood and, and in your temperament, that's a great way to meet other writers. Um, or, um, you know, creating a writing group for yourself, you know, taking the reins on that and making it the kind of group you want to be in. You know, whether you issue certain kinds of rules or guidelines or, you know, whatever, but kind of creating what you want. Um, that was very powerful for me. And the other benefit of the Voices of the Middle West project, as well as publishing with Wayne State and getting to know other Wayne State authors, was just to appreciate Midwestern um, literature and the literature of Michigan on a much deeper level and to really get to know who I should be reading as I'm writing about the Midwest. Um, I guess I had, I had always written about the Midwest in one way or another, but I'd never really embraced it as a character the way I started doing after I met all these fabulous authors through the Voices Project um, and reading other Wayne State authors, so. Well, that's uh, hard to believe, reading your, your book. It's hard to uh, believe you hadn't <laughs> had the Midwest as a character in your because it's huge in your uh, collection. It's beautiful. Um, for me, um, I found people by talking about reading and writing, um, you know, at, at parties, at work, or whatever, and I'd say, oh, you write, you write, oh, and then I might trade a little bit with someone, and if it felt like we were, if they were better than I was, or, <laughs> or if we were writing at a similar level, I'd say, do you want to do a writing group, and it was just really, it's like your book club, same thing, you know, you invite people in, people fall off, People don't like the structure, people do, and it's sort of permeable until you have the right gel. You can look at your libraries, your uh, coffee shops, there's um, the meetups online, you can find meetups online. Um, it's, it's all about going to readings. I mean, go to reading in your locality, and even if it's not a genre that you're that interested in, but People who wander around there are people who are interested often in writing and um, and see if the person you're sitting beside is a writer and just chat them up and find out uh, what they do and see if you can find a buddy. I got a Fitbit, which made me very competitive with myself for my exercise. And I find a writing buddy does exactly the same thing for my writing. It's like if I'm if I can be obligated to someone else that I will produce. If it's for me, I'm gonna put it aside, something else is more important. And I'm not talking about an agent's deadline. I'm talking about just getting up and getting a poem done, getting a story done, um, crystallizing an essay. If I know I've got to meet with somebody at the end of the week, something's gonna happen for me, even if it happens the hour before the meeting, which is often would happen. There was something about that time pressure and being having a buddy you know, just like you do in other aspects of your life that really kind of elevates your commitment to your writing, in my opinion. Um, we do have a question, uh, and you guys, please send your questions around because we're not gonna do at the end kind of stuff if we can answer your questions right now. So this is a great question. How does reading and constructively critiquing other people's work in your group help you with your own work? Um, I'll, I'll answer that. So for a living, I critique um, student work and have done plenty of that type of work in um, various writers groups and, and different um, venues. Um, and one thing that I love about um, being, you know, having the privilege of critiquing someone else's work is not only am I really trying to figure out, you know, what can be the, the possibilities for the next draft and how can this writing grow, but I often find myself critiquing the very things that I'm 
working on in my own work, you know, maybe stuck in my own work, trying to figure out um, how to move past whatever it is that's, you know, sticking with me. Sometimes in my own writing, I don't even know what the problem is. And then I realize, you know, that I'm critiquing similar issues in other work and I'm thinking, oh, wait a minute. This is how, you know, I'm seeing this lack in this, in this manuscript and that's bothering me and I'm noting it because there's a lack in my own work. I get it now. Or I see it being done well in someone else's work. I'm like, oh, okay. I, I see how this writer is doing that. So for me, it's, it's really learning as much or more about my own work um, as I'm offering to um, to the other to the, to the writer, um, and I find that just really an essential part of being a writer is um, being able to really be open and critiquing others' work, um, you know, and really coaching that writer and myself through you know some of the the sticking points um, in a manuscript. Mm -hmm. Kelly. Um, I think it also helps me to see their process because I might be in a, you know, a writing workshop with someone I really admire and it really helps to see that it doesn't come out fully formed like that. <laughs> you know, it takes a lot of work, a lot of um, different drafts and, and it's been a great um, thing to be able to trust other people to, to give them whatever you come up with. Like if you think it's dribble, but you're still giving it out to them. Um, I think that's been really helpful to me too because I tend to be a perfectionist and if it's terrible then I, I'm berating myself and I don't want to go on and I don't know if this is a novel that's going to work or whatever. But when you see other people in the same boat, you just, it makes a huge difference. So I think we traded something once um, and I have blah blahs, like in the middle of my sentence I'll say, and she blah 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 blah. And I type blah, I know blah, that, and, then I keep it, and I remember you commenting on, oh, I see your process. There's a lot of blah, blah, you know, in your, in your work, but, um, but so I, I don't. Love, I love that because that was nonfiction and I wasn't used to writing nonfiction and I thought, okay, this is how you do it. You write as much as you can and you don't know like what year it took place. So you just put blah, blah right. <laughs> and you keep right. going. It was great. Yeah. <laughs> Lolita, did you have anything to add to that? What what purpose does it serve to, is it kind of a waste of time sometimes to read other people? Look, if you're in a writing group and you've got five people in the group and you're reading 20 pages each, so you're starting to knock out 100 pages before your group, I mean, that's a big commitment. Like, is that a waste of time? I wouldn't say it's a waste of time. It just depends on where your head's at with any particular project. I'm kind of like, um, uh, um, Laura, you know, I did a lot of uh, critiquing of student student work in particular, and um, it's incredibly insightful, um, especially I think because we we had the tutorial program at UM, and I just love the ability to just talk to students and and find out their process as you're talking about um, Kelly and what's really behind it because by the time you throw some words on paper, sometimes you distill out what's really behind it, what really needs to go on the paper. And it's, it's, it's kind of cool um, being able to talk to, to folks like that, yeah. Mm -hmm. And just remember, if you are in a community, it's community communal. So it's not all about what you're getting out of it. You have to give back to the people in the community. So if you expect good critiquing of your work, then you better be prepared to do the same, like read their stuff and give them good advice. You're honest and your best try, you know, or else it's really not, it's not, um, it's not a good idea to build community if you don't want to be a part of one. So you gotta remember that. Um, we also got a question about, and, and I think this is, this is such an awesome question, and that is, what if you are writing about or you're a member of a marginalized community, um, and how do you build your writing community around a topic that feels marginalized or that you are, um, per perhaps you're the only one in your group that holds a particular identity? I think this goes to uh, a little bit to the question of safety that you brought up before, Lolita. But Kelly, I know you've done some some work around um, marginalized topics or taboo topics as well. So, how do you navigate that? 
Um, well, unless Lolita wants to go, I'll just say that when I was writing about um, a community which I was not a part of, um, it really helped me a lot to consult with other people who were a part of the community. So in our writers group, especially ours, there were people from all over the world. And so I felt like I could run this by, you know, especially when I was really nervous, I didn't want to, I just didn't want to do anything wrong. So, so I, it helped a lot to run it by people and say, what do you think of this? Um, and even if it was kind of a risk, when I explained, you know, why I was doing it, you know, it was helpful that they understood. Um, but I think that was probably one of the greatest things was that our group was from all over the world. And I also, you know, I grew up in Washington, DC, you know, surrounded by people from all over the world. And you have to, you know, just be learning all the time. Otherwise, your, your, you know, your, yourself is so small, your community is so small, your writing will be really small unless you reach out. So I think that's, it's huge. It's a huge part of writing. And writing is all about empathy. So you, you know, you have to get outside of yourself, but you want to make sure that you're doing that correctly. So it's... So you're talking about uh, writing from the vantage point. And this is very much um, a conversation these days that we could probably do a whole nother panel on. And that is like, who has, who has the right to a story? Who has a right to write a story? Do you have to be a part of that community or that experience in order to write about it? Um, and from your vantage point, you were writing about a marginalized community, about an experience that you did not personally have. And you felt like you needed people around you to sort of help you make sure you didn't overstep your bounds, that you were giving enough deference to the community that you were writing about. Correct. Yeah. Which is so, a little in the question, maybe, but yeah. Yeah. And so what if you are part of that marginalized community that that voice is, is rarely out there. How do you find the people, the support, the writing community to get your, your story out? I can, um, I can jump in um, if, unless Lolita is ready to speak, but um, I think forming a writing community is, is tough um, under a lot of different circumstances and particularly so for a marginalized um, community member. Um, and, and the other, thing that can be, you know, tough about forming a writing community is um, some folks have more financial resources to travel to conferences or to take mm -hmm. workshops from writers they admire. And some folks simply do not have those resources, but it is a fact of writing and publishing that there's a little bit of a, or in some cases, a lot of a pay to play uh, networking system, um, whether or not it's, you know, can you afford an MFA, especially if you don't get fully funded to, you know, how do you form mm -hmm. these communities if, a, a big part of that is, you know, connecting with other writers in far flung places. Um, I, I would say the two answers I have um, to that specific question are, if you can afford to take workshops from writers in those communities that you admire, um, or connect with them at conferences, which of course can be intimidating and difficult to do depending on how famous they are, you should do it. Um, you should seek the, these folks out. You should um, talk to them about their work. You should read what they write. Um, and, and if you can't afford to do that, I think you've got a longer um, road to hoe. Uh, for me, what my very first community was, was reading books, honestly. My books um, as a kid were my first community, and, and because I was kind of a shy kid, we moved a lot. In many cases, it was my only community. And so I think that you want to um, read books by members of the community that you are a part of. Mm -hmm. um, don't just limit yourselves to, you know, what has been, you know, called the canon in the past, but seek out those writers. And not all of them are with major publishers. Um, some of them are going to be with indie presses. Some of them are going to be with Wayne State or other university presses. Go out of your way to find the writers who are writing with the voice and identity that speaks to you and read them and find their articles online. And, you know, maybe they're going to come to um, your area bookstore. We'll go to their reading, talk to them, um, you know, do what you can do within your resources. And the life of a writer um, is, is long, sadly so in some cases. And, 
you know, it may take years to sort of make inroads into, um, into those communities, but you can, you can do it. And of course, if you're ever in a position to organize a group or a, a festival around these um, communities that you want to be a part of and that you admire, see if you can make that, that happen after the pandemic is over. <laughs> hey, this is great stuff uh, here, though, on, online. This is great stuff yeah. online. I, I, I think that um, the whole. I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm mismarginalized. <laughs> I am, I am marginalized in every um, possible way. Even, even in the city like um, Detroit, it, it seemed like as a woman, I represented. Um, I mean, factory. I write about machines, <laughs> all that kind of stuff. So there was a lot of, a lot of um, difference. I think in just the communities that I. I moved around um, in, and um, so so I I think when I really came full face um, with this whole question of marginalization and what it really means and the gift that I had been given by my my parents and the way my life went was that I, I sort of felt entitled and, and able to write about a lot of different people from a lot of different um, perspectives. I remember when I was um, teaching in the <clears throat> University of Michigan uh, residential college semester in Detroit program, we had a lot of students coming into Detroit and <clears throat> they would take my writing class and they would, um, they would come up with, they would, they would feel intimidated by having to write about Detroit because Detroit was generally so much different um, in terms of uh, culture and, and color and so on and so forth, you know, and I tell them you have to get over that you're a writer You can't just stay inside of yourself and write about yourself, you know I mean you gotta you gotta get out here and, and observe that world around you and find out How is it that that you're able that you're able to write about um, different people? Um, and I think like you, you know um, Laura Ann Kelly just talking about um, getting to know people, getting out, having genuine relationships um, is just, is, is what's really important. And, and being in the factory um, was incredibly um, important and, and wonderful because I just, I just got to know a lot of dif different people across the um, spectrum. And then, you know, the Caribbean content is just so, you know, there's just so much stuff going on and so many different people just in my family. <laughs> and, and um, I don't, I, you know, I don't know what else to say about it, but you, you know, uh, I just yeah. read the most wonderful little book that was written by a woman um, who uh, has recently passed, her grandson passed it along to me and she was a woman from um, Trinidad. I can't, oh gosh, I can't remember her, her name now, but um, the book was called Olas Grandes. It wasn't like a major, um, tr uh, you know, literary feat, but there was, it was, it was so comforting just to, to, to read the, the language and to, and to, you know, to, to get the imagery that she was so great at um, presenting in the book about the waves and the landscape of Trinidad and so on and so forth. And, it, you know, sometimes I, I know I'm very guilty of thinking that I, I, something that I write has to be incredibly grand. I think we all are. We're all writing the American novel or something like that, the great American novel. But sometimes these really simple stories just get you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, um, it occurred to me listening to you guys that maybe if you are in a marginalized community or, or holding sort of an identity that is not widely known, um, you might have to do two steps. One step is to find your community around the content or the identity and make sure you know your, the story you're trying to tell. And so that would mean that you'd have people around you who've had that experience, who can read a passage and go, oh yeah, oh yeah, that's totally it. That's exactly how they would say it. That's exactly how I felt. You nailed it on, on how traumatic this was or how joyous this was or exactly what this kind of wedding is like. You nailed it, you nailed it. And then once you have that and you feel very certain about your story, then you go to a group, a community that can help you with craft. And 
And you got, you can only do that when you're sure of your story, because people are going to say things in a critique that are, are crap, you know, like they don't get it. They don't understand your story. Um, They want to write it their way because they've written it in their head or they have their stereotypes. But the benefit is being able to hear how readers are going to hear this story, how it's going to bounce off of other people's heads. You know, in, in a group that Kelly and I were talking about, I had never been in a group with men. And I, in my mind, I'm writing to women. If men pick it up, fine. I don't care. But my audience is women. And I had never written, like actually drafted with men in, in my stuff, you know, before it ever came out. And for me to hear them, with, and so I could hear things, and sometimes I'd say, oh, wow, what a perspective. I didn't think about that. And sometimes I go, eh, that's why I'm not writing for men, you know. But I wasn't crushed. I just got to hear how it was, how it was landing. So I think you have to feel safe in that identity. If you're an adoptee and you're writing about that experience, you know, that I think it helps to be around other people who've had that experience, and you are absolutely certain about what your story is. And then you can take it to another group that's really gonna help you with craft, with things like point of view and, and all the details and you know, all the other stuff that will, that will really make your story um, a well-written story. You just gotta be careful. Your soul has gotta be straight, right, Lolita? You gotta have your soul people around you, Kelly. Yeah. <laughs> your soul people around you first. You gotta be certain about what your story is. You know, conversely, a writing group can help you find that if they are trusted, uh, if you trust them enough, and if they are good enough readers and good enough with feedback. So um, I want to just, we don't have a lot more time, but how about a couple of warnings? I Maybe I have sounded out one. Um, warning signs of you are in a bad place. You've gone to the sunken place with this group and you need to maybe ditch it, find something else. What are some warning signs for you guys? Big warning sign for me is when I feel really tense and unhappy about being there and don't want to go. I mean, it's just as simple as that. It's like, oh my God, and you start feeling depressed and shaky and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Kelly. I would, I would say um, I went to a writer's conference when I was really young, maybe 25, and I tell this story all the time because I think it's so important, but I was studying with this woman who was very, you know, well accomplished and well known, and she said some things that really crushed me about my writing, and even though I'd gotten a scholarship there and I should have been proud of myself, she really knocked me down, and I didn't write poetry again for like, you know, a decade or more. And so I always say to people like, you know, make sure, like you were saying before, that you have, you know, that you're not going to be crushed, right? You don't want to get into a situation where I think people can feel so proud that they got in somewhere and they go there and they take everything the writer, you know, the teacher says as gospel, but it's not, you know, it's not. They don't know who you are right now as a writer. They don't know who you're going to become. They don't know what else you've written. They are only looking at a small port. So don't let anyone take your, your dreams, your, you know, it's just, don't let them take it away from you. It's your writing life. And they That's don't know it all. <laughs> they don't know it all. Right. They don't know your story so and only you can tell the story. They don't know. Right. That's so that's great. my warning. Laura, what about you? Yeah. Well, I went to a writing conference once and took a, a writing workshop from a, you know, well-known author. And it really is buyer beware because sometimes, you know, um, when we talk about hanging out with writers who are better than us or writers we admire, they're not always the best teachers. And so, you know, um, my last name is Thomas. And so I, and it was alphabetical order. So of course my uh, story was last, it was a weekend conference. Um, and I put quite a lot of time and effort into critiquing everyone else's manuscripts. I think there were 12 in this group. Um, and again, this is a well-known conference. I was really excited to attend, um, and I won't name it. And, you know, the story that got the most attention um, had been written by the youngest and most attractive woman in the group. Um, and, you know, her story was very, very good, but I think other stories merited as much attention as this young woman. So there was clearly a flirtation going on. Um, and my story got a total of 10 minutes on the last day. Wow. I got no critique from all that work. 
And then as soon as I left the group, this other group member tried hitting on me and I had to trot out that old line about, well, my husband's waiting for me, you know, for dinner, which actually was true. He was sitting on a bench very sweetly outside the restaurant, waiting for me to come to complain about my lost weekend, you know, and you know, the, the, the meat market, you know, or what passes for one for writers, which is pretty lame. On <laughs> you know, that was my thing. So I guess um, I'm going to just, you know, talking everything that's been said about how do you know you're in a bad group, obviously, you know, you know you're in a bad group if you're not getting what you came there to get. Um, if it's a long-standing group and it's just become um, something that you dread, um, and, you know, I, I feel like those feelings aren't necessarily, you know, I've talked about this with my writer friends all the time, it's not necessarily that that group has turned bad. You know, um, if you've been okay or even happy and then, you know, you're just not, it can be more about where you're at with your work. You know, uh, sometimes you can't hear, you know, other voices and you, you're just, you just have to kind of get down with yourself for a while and figure your own stuff out and just kind of get that space. I think that's something that we all um, juggle is we have these communities that nurture us and um, that we want to nurture and feed. And then, you know, there, then there's our work, which is for, you know, for writers, just extremely um, time consuming, if nothing else, and, and um, emotionally um, something you have to really commit to. And sometimes you just need the space. And so I think, uh, you know, there may be times where you step in and out of a group, you know, that it's not working for you for a while. Maybe it's okay to say, hey, you know, um, love you, not working for me right now. I just need to, to be on my own for a while and maybe step back in. Um, I think that if it's a truly terrible situation, um, you know, then you just have to make your excuses and cut and run and find something that's working for you. I do think, Laura, um, this that's a great point that you just made that's often not made. I mean, I have been in groups where there's someone that never writes, they never write and they come and they read everything and they give great critiques and they never bring a word to the table. So you can err the other way where you're all about community and not at all about your own work and your own craft, or you feel so guilty, you know, like, oh, sure, I'll read it. I will give you feedback and you end up being eaten alive by all the other writers and all of the other people that need an, an eye on their work, it, you forget about your own. Uh, I can't imagine uh, teaching full time because that's just got to be something that happens like nonstop, like how to draw the line. And then not even to mention your colleagues who probably also love your voice and your support and your advice. Um, and, and when to just say enough is enough, I can't do that right now. It's got to be pretty hard because you know you got to meet them on the way back up and down, right? And so you know you're going to ask someone for a review or you're going to ask someone for a favor or ask someone how to get into a certain literary magazine or something. And you don't want to have offended people or brush them off um, because you were overwhelmed. So it's political, guys, on top of that. It's, it's very political. You know, on some levels, this can can feel a little like high school, you know, like what group are you in? Don't, you know, be nice to the band guys and be nice to the, you know, I don't know, the lunch crew, because you you are going between groups. It is community that you're juggling and it's more than one. And the, but the main community is yourself and the community of characters in your head and the community of stories in your head. So I, you have to have fidelity to that. Um, and once you figure out what that is and what you need, then that has got to guide you um, to finding a community for yourself. So we're right at the top of the hour. I don't have any more questions in my queue. Does anyone want to throw one out really quick before we wrap up? Type it in the chat area. And while I'm waiting to see if anything pops up, uh, remember to get Kelly's book, remember to get Laura's book, remember to go and find Lolita's great work. Um, I, I love all of the books I've, I've managed, this panel I've managed to have read everyone's work. So that's, woohoo, so I can personally attest that they are all fantastic. Um, all right, nothing else is coming up. So we love you guys. Thank